Yes, all that. Okay, so uh, next up, we have our featured, he likes a fan, so if my hair is blowing around, that's why. Um, our featured speaker is done with government overreach, especially from DC. And he is truly taking the old adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Yeah. So he is running for Lieutenant Governor. Woo. For our great state of Texas, please welcome Daniel Miller. That was very supermodel, right? Where is that thing? I know, I know. Awesome. Howdy. Oh, that won't do it all. Let's try that again. Howdy. That's what I'm talking about. Well, Joy spilled the beans. Since the last time I was here, I did a thing. Hang on. This here. Yeah. 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 I, will, uh, I will say this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel Miller, and I am a sixth generation Texan. I am president of the Texas Nationalist Movement, the organization that has been working for 15 years to make Texas happen, and I am a candidate for Lieutenant Governor of the state of Texas. Now, you know, it's funny because when, when this whole thing started, people started coming in, had a gentleman come up to me. He said, you know, I saw you speak the other day and I got your book. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of wondered if I was going to hear the same thing that you always say. And the short answer to you is yes. Amen. You're going to hear exactly the same thing. Except now, after what I just heard, I've got another tip for you. If you want to be exempted from federal vaccine mandates, the solution is quite simple. You eliminate the federal government from the equation. Naughty me. I, I will tell you, since I announced that I'm running for lieutenant governor, I, I have had all kinds of people from the political class tell me what I should say, what I should not say, what I should wear, what I should not wear, whether I should have facial hair or not. Whether I should purchase a toupee or not. <laughs> and I've already started off on a bad foot. I, you know, I have authority problems, folks. Have you noticed? <laughs> so I'm going to do something that is going to drive them absolutely bonkers. Are you ready? All those political whispers. I'm going to ask you the question that I have gone around Texas for 25 years asking. And it is not a rhetorical question. I want you to answer it loud and proud. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That wasn't the question, but it was a good trial run. <laughs> here it comes. Who here is ready for Texas? that feels after going through 25 years of pure hell? I mean, it only took 25 years to become an overnight success. But you know, I digress because here's what I want you all to understand tonight. As we share our time here together, I want you to understand that there is something happening right now in Texas. There is a, a stirring and a fire that is sweeping across this place, that is rocking the foundations of the political establishment. And I'm gonna tell you, it's about time. For far too long, we have had our lives governed by a bunch of people who think we are too stupid to govern ourselves. They tell us what we can do, what we can't do, what we can think, what we can't think, what we can say, what we cannot say. And folks, that is not the Texas that the men of the Alamo died for. They also told me I needed to ditch the glasses for contacts. That's not going to happen. It's not. 
Just like I'm never going to stop talking about how awesome Texas is and how awesome Texas can be as a self-governing nation among nations. Now, I'm going to give y'all an option. As I do many people, do you want me to sugarcoat tonight? Or do you want, you want me to give it to you straight? All straight, no chaser, right? Pull no punches. Well, you're about to get what you asked for. Right now, Texans are sick and tired of living under 180,000 pages of federal laws, rules, and regulations administered by two and a half million unelected bureaucrats. We're sick and tired of having to go beg for our basic God-given rights from a bunch of black-robed thugs in federal courts that can decide to overturn our will with the stroke of a pen. Aren't we? And boy, howdy, we got a problem. I, and, and I can spend tonight and all through the night and some in the morning and probably all the way through lunch, maybe mid-afternoon, 11th second breakfast, <laughs> dinner, supper, about all the ways that the federal government trounces on us. But we all know it, don't we? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, I can talk about the fact that we overpay anywhere from 103 to $160 billion annually into the federal system. That's an overpayment. That's money that comes out of my pocket and your pocket. It comes out of the pockets of people that are trying to put food in their children's mouths or make ends meet and pay their bills. I can talk about the mountain of federal regulations that have broken the bridge between, between poverty and prosperity, and that is entrepreneurship, starting your own business. And we can talk about the federal origins of that, how in these last two legislative sessions, almost half of the bills filed by our legislators referenced a federal law, a federal regulation, a federal agency, a federal court decision, which means that our legislators are passing bills that are effectively written by federal bureaucrats and K Street lobbyists in Washington, D.C. And the last I checked, it's not le any less swampy than it has ever been in D.C., is it? No. Do we need to talk about the infrastructure bill? Yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> but I love your moxie. It was enthusiasm. Do you have a, a, a certificate for enthusiasm? <laughs> Let's make, let's make one and let's cue this gentleman up over here. He's wound up. I work in infrastructure. <laughs> so let me tell you, we got problems on the federal side, but let me tell you, that, that trickle-down effect is we got a bunch of Bush League politicians in Austin, Texas that are either too weak or too compliant to stand up for people like us. For so many of these people, when they see come and take it on a flag, it is not the statement of defiance that it was meant at the Battle of Gonzales. It is terms of their surrender. And let me tell you, Texans don't surrender. No retreat, no compromise, no surrender. Especially when it comes to our fundamental rights. And I will tell you this, as I had crisscrossed this state and poured my life and soul into seeing Texas become a self-governing independent nation, like the 200 other self-governing independent nations around the world that somehow seem to get it done, I look around at my fellow countrymen and I say, when is our turn? When are we going to enjoy that blessing of self-government, that accountability, that responsibility, that power to be able to punch our own ticket and to set our own political destiny. And year after year after year, as the numbers have grown, 
I joke all the time and say when we started the TNM in 2005, support for Texas independence was in single digits, but it's always been higher than the approval rating of the United States Congress. Now granted, that's not much of a feat when you understand that their approval rating is either somewhere right above or below that of leprosy at any given moment, right? But to watch our countrymen, our fellow Texans, wake up and understand the power that we have in our hands. I have preached a message from one end of Texas to the other, reminding people of Article 1, Section 2 of the Texas Constitution. This starts with the words, all political power is inherent in the people. All political power is inherent in who? The people. Folks, that didn't sound very powerful. We're going to try that again. All political power is inherent in who? The people. And who are we? The people. And let me tell you something, folks. They're about to find out just how powerful we are. This last legislative session taught us everything we need to know about the state government. These elected officials in Austin. The ones that are campaign conservatives, and I would, I would say campaign Texans. Because when they have been given a choice to do right by the people of Texas or to capitulate to the federal government, we have always ended up on the losing end. I'm sorry, folks, but a defense strategy does not include tweet, sue, lose, and repeat. And that's what we've been getting out of our leaders in Austin. Case in point, our southern border. The southern border has been in crisis for 20 plus years. My first trip down to the southern border in Mexico was in 2001. I made three trips that year to get firsthand experience with what the ranchers and the citizens down there were living through. Now let me ask you a question. We've all known for some time that the border is a shambles. Has it gotten any better? No. But you understand that our governor and lieutenant governor and legislators have been crisscrossing Texas during campaign season promising to secure the border, right? Yeah, right. So let me ask you a question. Did they lie to us? Yes. Are they representing you? No. Well, if they, if they don't represent us, then they cannot represent us. They gotta go. Yeah. So earlier this year, when Kyle Biederman introduced the Texas Independence Referendum Act, that would have given each and every one of us an equal opportunity to vote up or down on the issue of Texas. The political establishment bared their fangs and showed their true contempt for us. Even though there were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of constituent communications to their offices, they sent us a clear message. They said, Texans, we know what's best for you. We will never put the issue of governance in your hands. And it was at that moment that everyone should have realized that we got a clean house. They got to go. They cannot represent us. But the question then becomes, who is it going to be that's going to rise up? Who is going to take their place? Who will capture that spirit and legacy of the founders of Texas? And I'm here to tell you, it's all of us that are going to do it. There is no, there is no political messiah that's going to ride in on a white horse. It's never happened, and it will not happen. Instead, like the revolution in 1836, everyday men and women are going to rise up. They're going to dig deep. They're going to lead. 
They're going to work. They're going to march. And they are going to secure our freedom and independence as promised in Article 1, Section 1 of the Texas Constitution. Much like these political consultants and all these political establishment types love to tell me what I can and cannot say and what I should wear and should not wear, let me tell you something right now. There is no test ever devised by humankind to measure the heart of a Texan. It does not exist. And so, at the urging and prodding of many people, I made the decision just, what, three weeks ago? Has it been three weeks already? Three weeks-ish? That I was going to challenge our sitting lieutenant governor in the Republican primary. And not just challenging, I was going to beat him. Because much like so many of these other people, we have been promised time and time and time again a laundry list of issues. How many people here got their property taxes lowered? Nope. But you understand every election cycle they promise relief. But you want to add insult to injury, understand that the property tax relief we allegedly got in the special session was right about the same cost as half the price of the cheap seats at an Astros game. Folks, that's not relief. Let me tell you what relief is. Abolishing the property tax. Kick it to the curb. Secure the border. We're promised all the time. And let me tell you what, the lieutenant governor can get it done. But again, he has campaigned on securing the border every election cycle and every session has failed. Because they won't do the hard thing. They won't stand up to the federal government and pour that $2 million they put to the DPS to be 40 miles inland, pour $2 million into fully militarizing the Texas State Guard and deploy them right on the river to turn back the invasion. Yeah. And when it comes to craziness, things that should be total no-brainers, like genital mutilation and chemical castration of our children, where are these leaders to be found? Nowhere. Nowhere. In a previous life, I might say that you would be hard pressed to find them with a hunting dog and a Ouija board. Let that roll around for a bit, folks. <laughs> it takes a little time to marinate. But I say this, beyond those issues, the one thing that I will guarantee as your lieutenant governor, is that I will be your lieutenant governor. I will always believe, I will always uphold as a bedrock all those words in Article 1, Section 2 that say that all political power is inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit. The people of Texas stand pledged to the preservation of a Republican form of government. And the people have at all times the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their government in such manner as they may think expedient. Yeah. I will say that the last two lieutenant governors that were asked about Article 1, Section 2 had to go look it up. Just saying. But what that ultimately means is this. I pledge that I'm going to be your lieutenant governor to represent you, to represent Texas, to finally, without hesitation, reservation, or equivocation, 
give the people of Texas an up or down vote on whether or not we should reassert our status as an independent nation again. It is not an afterthought for me. It is a priority. Just like abolishing the property tax, securing the border, ending vaccine mandates, and making sure that parents are always the primary stakeholders in their children's education. I'm not here to make your decision for Texas, but I'm here to make sure that you at least get one. Yeah. So that being said, I don't know where I'm at on time. I'm terrible with time. How am I on time? I'm good. Don't say that. That's like saying signal to a bulldog. <laughs> so here's what, here's what I want to impart to you guys tonight is that this is not about me. It's not about Mark. It's not about Shelly. Any of us that are running or will be running, have run in the past, it's about all of us. It's about all of us standing up, doing our part to take back our government, starting with the one in Austin. And it's about upholding those sacred words that are in Article 1, Section 1 of the Texas Constitution that starts off by saying that Texas is a free and independent state. So I, I, wanna, I wanna encourage you all tonight, beyond the discussion that we have here tonight and the rah-rah, right? And the excitement that we get, I wanna encourage every one of you to get in the fight because we cannot do it alone. The Texas Revolution was very instructive for us. It taught us that people, regular people, had the opportunity with enough sacrifice and enough determination and enough grit to take out the most modernized army in the Western Hemisphere, to stand up for the principles that they held dear. And while those days it was a war of cannon and musket, our job is far easier. It's knocking on doors. It's making phone calls. It's opening our mouths and talking to our neighbors. It's making sure that we get them to the polls to vote so that we can overcome the margin of theft. And, and I say that that was, a, that was a, a quote that was told to me by a sitting state representative who said that when you calculate numbers for your election, always calculate beyond the margin of theft. What does that tell you, folks? We've had a problem for quite some time. So I'm going to encourage each and every one of you, if you are ready to take Texas back, they'll take care no worries. If you're ready to take Texas back, we want you to come with us. We want you to help us. We want you, number one, we need contributions. Every elected, every person running for office is going to be asking you for contributions. But let me tell you something. It's going to take it to make it work. Dan Patrick raised over $2 million from 18 donors in one day. You want to know who's running your state? It's the donor class. It's the donor class. But we overcome that with sheer numbers. Numbers, sheer numbers of the people standing up and saying enough is enough. But more than that, I'm going to ask you to volunteer to become a part of the campaign, to be the face and the hands and the legs of a new Texian army that can rise up, get active, and sweep across Texas from Dalhart to Del Rio and El Paso to Orange. Urban, rural, border, hill country, wherever it is. We don't surrender a square inch. And let me tell you, this is why the political establishment is afraid. Since I said that I was gonna be in the race, the chatter has begun because they know what we know. They know that Texas supporters are ready for a champion. 
Just like that shout that you gave today, that shout is being heard all across Texas. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if Texas goes to a vote, we win. And we don't win by a little, we win by a lot. Yeah. As I have said many times before, I've got poll numbers to back that up, but I don't need poll numbers because here's what I know. On the way here tonight, I had to stop by Office Depot and pick up some copies of some things that I needed for tonight. And Daffy and I struck up a conversation with the cashier there. She asked about Daffy's shirt, about the Texas Nationals movement. Daffy told her I was running for Lieutenant Governor. And she said, okay, so you mean like making Texas its own country again? It's like, yeah. She said, I, I, I'd vote for that. I, I'm in. How, how do I do that? I said, well, look, let me just ask you a question. If Texas was a free, independent, self-governing nation right now, right? Think about it. If we were already an independent government, if you were able to spin the globe around and put your finger down and go, there's Texas, one of 200 self-governing independent nations. With the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world, which is what we would be, free of the federal regulations and the red tape yes. and the overpayments. We had control over our own immigration and border policy. We had our own military. We had our own currency. We had our own embassies and passports. Everything that a self-governing independent nation has. And instead of talking about leaving, we were talking about whether or not we would join the union. Knowing everything you know about the federal government right now, would you vote to join the union? No! Well, guess what? That's exactly what she said. <laughs> and if you wouldn't vote to join, then why in the world would you ever vote to stay? That right there is what they're afraid of. This is why the political establishment is quaking, because candidates are rising up, including yours truly, and unabashedly saying that we believe in Texas. We believe in our ability to get the job done. And at the end of the day, as we make this run for lieutenant governor together, not just me, but all of us, and all of these other candidates that are coming up for state representative, state senator, from the state house to the schoolhouse, that are ready to reject federal rule and rule by the cabal in Austin of those apologists for Washington, D.C., to shuck off the rule of President Pudding Pop. Yeah. <laughs> and those bureaucrats. I'm just going to say, I didn't trademark President Putin Pot. Feel free to use it without attribution. But as people are ready, candidates are ready to stand up. At the end of the day, understand that we're all doing it for you. We're standing up for you to be your champion, to be your hands, to be your voice in the halls of Austin. To wade into that swamp and pull the plug and drain it. And like Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple, running the political establishment out of there. We're doing it for you. You know, I wonder how they would behave if you went there and really flipped over tables. I don't know. Yeah. Don't tempt it. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't say sick them to a bulldog. I thought we covered that one. That was one of the rules. So, get involved. Make a contribution. Talk to your neighbors. Volunteer. You can pop this fancy QR code behind me on the sign or go visit the table. But get in the game. Because let me tell you, somewhere... One of our supporters, Beverly Alford, is probably going to watch this on video somewhere. Sam Houston did not win San Jacinto with a bunch of cheerleaders. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Well, long as I told you I'm not pulling punches, people. No gloves. You asked for it. So, 
I'm going to leave you with these words because Rebecca stood up and I feel like that's a time signal. I don't know. No, no she's my back. Ten minutes. So you got time. I got ten minutes. Got ten minutes. How does this happen? How do I cut it short? That never happens. Okay. More time to no, no. Look, I'll take. Some, I'll, ta I'll take. What I'll do is I'll, I'll take some questions, but not before I leave you with the final words. The quote that I, I, I say at the end of every speech, one that will curl the toenails of the political consultants because they will tell. They say, "Stop!" They'll, they'll tell, I'm telling you, they've already told me. They've gone through my speeches. You know, you really shouldn't shouldn't say this. It's like this is why I don't hire consultants. You know, I don't need to be nagged, right? I'm going to be me. So I'm going to leave you with these words. And it was Sam Houston who said them. And they inspire me throughout the thick and thin of 25 years. After Texas joined the union, he said this. He said that Texas will again lift its head and stand among the nations. I do believe that that time is now. That as Texans, we will stand as a nation. And the question that I leave you with tonight is this. Will you stand with her? Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I have a very short amount of time for some questions. Or for you guys to dodge things that you throw at me. I'm going to tell you, I'm not, pretty, I'm not very agile, so... this thing called math yeah look I, I, I wrote a book called Texas why and how Texas will leave the union it's over there it has all those answers in it but we also made them available on a website at texitnow.org but but to your point here's the practical thing and I'll, I'll address the first of your 97 questions <laughs> how does it work something people need to understand is Texas is not a process I, I told a gentleman on a radio interview today that there is no single elected official who has or should ever have the power to unilaterally pull Texas out of the union. It should always come down to a vote of the people, right? Yeah. Article 1, Section 2 must be respected. But understand that that vote itself is not Texas. That is just a referendum to gauge the political will of the people of Texas. And so literally, the day after the vote, beyond fireworks and probably a lot of hungover people, <laughs> not much is gonna be different, right? It kicks off that process for us to begin to e extract ourselves and reassert our status as an independent nation. L little bonus, four things, constitutional, statutory, international covenants and agreements, and then negotiated issues like national debt, military bases, etc. So there we go. Uh, this is trouble. Yes, sir. Mr. Miller. How much would it cost to stay in the United States? It's going to cost everything you have. How about you? It's going to, it's going to cost your future to stay. Thank you, sir. And our children and their children. Look, I, I will say this, and I firmly believe this. You know, I, I, I talk all the time about the 12th day of the Alamo, which was the day that Travis drew the line in the sand. Right? It's when he took all of them into the courtyard, he explained how dire the situation was. He said, I'm going to stay here and do my duty. Drew the line in the sand and said, those of you who will stay here with me cross this line in the sand. I, I refer to that because it is a, a, a decision moment, right? And I believe that we all have our personal line in the sand moments, but collectively, as Texans, we have these pivot points, these line in the sand moments where one way is certain, much like the other way. These, these forks in the road, if that makes it easier for folks, the line of the sand is way more Texas, so I say that. But the point is, if we do nothing, if we allow it to continue, let's play out what that looks like. Let's look at it, because we know that over, at least over the last 20 plus years, nothing has gotten better, it's only gotten worse, right? Whether it's the federal debt, whether it's the border, whether it's the, the neo-Marxist takeover of Washington, D.C., right? It's only gotten worse. 
So if we do nothing, understand that that path ends in Texas no longer being Texas and being nothing more than an administrative subdivision of a centralized government in Washington, D.C. that bears more resemblance to the Soviet Union than that government envisioned by the founders who wrote the United States Constitution. So for us, and especially people that support Texas and people definitely in the TNM, this is an existential crisis for us. If we fail on this day, at this time, Texas will not exist for future generations as we know it. And we already know that they're attacking it, right? Two years ago, we had to fight the State Board of Education over referring to the, the defenders of the Alamo as heroes. They wanted to take it out because it was a value-charged word. We've been fighting George P. Bush. Thank goodness he's no longer going to be the, in the, the land commissioner. But we've been fighting him in the city of San Antonio over their neo-Marxist makeover called Reimagining the Alamo, where they wanted to move the cenotaph, the empty tomb of the Alamo defenders. They're already trying to change. And look, this is a Breitbart thing. Breitbart used to say that politics is downstream from culture. And if they target our culture and they change it, future generations will not know Texas as we have known Texas. Freedom and liberty will be erased. The Alamo will go down as a bad experiment of a bunch of white guys who died to preserve slavery. That's what they want. They want to control our children by these takeovers, by eliminating parents as the chief stakeholders in their children's education. Not my words, the Federal Department of Education. So Tim, you kicked the dog. I did. You did. And so ultimately the cost for staying in the union is Texas. That's right. And I'm not willing to sacrifice Texas. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you this, and I think this is a, a, an important distinction to make. Not everyone who's coming here from those places is wanting to remake Texas. They're coming here because they want to be Texan. Yeah, and and you know, look, we, we hear it all the time. And, and we even had one of the gubernatorial candidates ask me about that and ask me if we allow non-Texans to join our organization. Big misconception, right? People that, that people think that only native born Texans can join our organization is not true. And, and what I tell what I told him is what I tell everyone, which is this. If Crockett and Bowie and Travis can come from outside of Texas and lay down their lives for Texas independence, then who are we to set the bar any higher? But to that point, and I think it's important for everyone to understand, is that there are a lot of people that are coming here as political, cultural, and economic refugees. But understand that the only way that we ever get to control how, uh, te how Texas handles immigration is outside of the federal government, period. And, and I will tell you, your number one danger right now is not just people that are coming over trying to remake Texas in the image of whatever failed state they left. It's the amount of campaign money that's pouring in from places like California and New York and Washington, D.C., into the coffers of these of these uh, elected officials. If we don't accept campaign money from foreign countries like China or Russia, why would we ever allow it to be accepted from places like California and New York? So that was.
controversial when I put that as a as part of my lieutenant governor's platform. By the way, yes, sir. You know, I get that question everywhere I go. I'm, I am on the Shelley Luther bandwagon, anyone but Abbott. And, and, I, and I say that because throughout the time that we have been working these issues related to Texas independence, Greg Abbott has never been a friend of ours. As a matter of fact, when David Dewhurst was Lieutenant Governor uh, and Greg Abbott was still Attorney General, Dewhurst actually wanted to file the Texas, he wanted to get one of the senators to file the Texas Independence Referendum Act. He was actively working with us. But he wanted, he wanted Abbott and the AG's office to be a part of those discussions. Abbott refused, not citing any sort of moral objection or legal objection, but the objection that he was getting ready to run for governor and was afraid how it would affect his campaign. So that pre president press release, or excuse me, governor press release, or Governor uh, Finger in the Wind, however you prefer to refer to him, uh, has, never been a, has never been a friend to us, and I would never support him. So honestly, any of the three people that were running, look, I, I would vote for a cardboard cutout of George Strait before I would vote for him. Yes, sir. Okay, so this is a, a petition discussion, so I did not mention this tonight, but I will. In June, the TNM launched a petition campaign. Texas does not have true citizen initiative, right? We can't go out and get signatures and put a law on the ballot that we can all go vote on. But in a very narrow instance in the Texas Election Code, 172.088, we are allowed to, by petition, put a non-binding question on a Republican or on a party primary ballot. So in June, we launched a campaign to collect petition signatures to force the Texas question on the Republican primary ballot. Woo! And so we are, our, our petition circulators have been combing the state. It is a process. It's not some dippy little online petition. I mean, it is an official petition on the Texas election code. And I would encourage any of you tonight that have not signed it, it's not saying that you're for Texas, but what it is saying is, is that you at least believe that it should be on the ballot and people should be able to vote on it. And I would encourage you to stop by that table over there, sign the petition while you're there, sign up on our commit to vote, our pledge list for our campaign. I sure would appreciate it. One more and I think we're done. Thank you, sir. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, what are you gonna do about countries that are purchasing Texas land, like China? Well, and you know, this, is, uh, this has been an issue for years, and it's come up. Uh, one of the things that we absolutely have to do is get some legislation on the table and get it past the hurdles. Understand that there have been legislators that have floated potential bills, have filed those pieces of legislation that would prevent that sort of thing, specifically related to any sort of critical infrastructure or things of that nature, uh, but leadership always stopped them. Look, the last two sessions, and, and I think it's important, so many of the things that we are passionate about fell victim to the, the cowardice of the elected leadership in Austin because they were afraid of what happened during the 2016 election. They were afraid of what happened in 2016, 2018 came around, they were scared. So what happened was they had a meeting, a big caucus of these Republican, uh, the Republican legislators, the leadership came in and they said, hey guys, no controversial bills on the floor, none. And so you lost a lot of great legislation. Monument protection, yeah. which was a huge one for the TNA. I mean, we fought that thing tooth and nail and got it right there and it got killed in the house in, in the place where conservative bills go to die, which is the calendars committee, right? So you're only gonna get that done with a change of leadership, right? The leadership stopped it because of their cowardice. You replace the leadership all of a sudden our priorities become actual priorities, including that. All right. Okay, that's my final question. Hey, thank you all so very much.
Thanks, everyone. Hey, I realized that I forgot someone really important on the board, my husband, <laughs> Brian. I think of us as one. I think that's what happened. So, Brian, come on up here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Allen West coming to speak December 4th, uh, running for governor. I hope that you can make it. Thank y'all so much. We'll see you next time. And make sure you come over and if you need to find out more about Daniel Miller. And uh, Paul Davis is over here and he'll be answering questions as well. Thank you. Good night.